All right, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. I know we're rushing you a little. Those on that side, if you want, you can move this way. We're going to be here for the next hour. So if you want a closer look or uh, if you want to, um, to be within better eyesight of, um, of our people, uh, come on over. So we don't have a lot of time here, but the parts of, of these symposia that I love most, and I love all of it, it's just the happiest week of the year for me, uh, is, is having scholars and, and um, the public really discuss things. You know, it's not just a presentation and then you get on an airplane and leave. It's this sort of, not a, scholars don't always agree. Sometimes they disagree powerfully. Uh, but we like to keep it civil, of course. Uh, but Roosevelt wouldn't necessarily. Um, he had a certain way of intellectual bullying when he needed it. Uh, but I want to just start by saying thank you to our three presenters. Rick, you, I, you're going to be speaking again here after the next break. And I know that um, Jeffrey Warrow's talk touched a, gr a fair amount on, on the Great War, World War I, and you probably are going to address that in a slightly different way. I don't know that we necessarily need to get too far into that at the moment, but let me just review a few of the areas of legacy. You, you, we can't possibly cover everything that we'd like to cover, but I just was jotting them down again. Uh, family, the legacy of Roosevelt's family. You know, he said, I promise you no family has ever enjoyed living in the White House as much as we Roosevelt's have done. And he regarded himself as the first real family uh, since um, the Lincolns. His impact on the presidency, um, enormous impact on the way we think about the presidency. Um, his constitutional legacy. Um, he was a broad constructionist, to put it lightly, and a Hamiltonian. Um, and the idea of strict construction just seemed to him to be a, a sort of insanity. Um, America's place in the world. You know, Roosevelt felt that it was time for us to take our proper place in the world, either at or near the top, and that the time was coming when the United States would be the major nation of the world, the hegemon, and he saw that as good, even though much of the country wasn't particularly ready for that. Uh, his impact on the economy and industrial relations, the balance of labor and capital, um, distri distributive justice, you know, the 1% and, and, and the many. Um, his legacy about immigration and, and the identity of Americans, you know, his long discussions of hyphenated Americans. And we heard this morning the tens of millions of people who were coming here who were not Anglo-Saxons and hadn't... Uh, Many of them didn't know English, and, and they were r raw recent immigrants and causing a lot of social disruption and a lot of anxiety in, in some quarters. His uh, impact and legacy on language and literature. He wrote 35 or more books, thousands of articles. Um, he coined words for our language. He engaged in spelling reform. Um, he's a major man of letters in addition to being all the else that he was. Um, the idea of the American West, the idea of, of the Western frontier, he and Frederick Jackson Turner and, and, and Remington and others were, in a sense, um, laying the groundwork of a, of a Western mythology that has been amazingly tenacious. Um, his impact and legacy in conservation, which we've talked about many times, but you see some of the images around the room. Devil's Tower, the first of his um, 18 national monuments. Crater Lake, uh, one of the five national parks that um, was authorized during Roosevelt's administration, doubling the number from five to ten. Um, petrified Forest in Arizona, which he made a national monument. It later graduated to national park status. And out in the hall, Crater Lake, one of his two national wildlife refuges here in North Dakota, um, two of his 51, he invented national wildlife refuges by executive order in 1903. Chase Lake is the one that we picture here. Uh, it's the largest uh, white pelican nesting uh, zone in the world. Um, and, and Roosevelt never saw it, but he designated it by executive order. And by the way, North Dakota has the most national wildlife refuges of any state at 63. Not the most acreage, that's Alaska, but the most number. Um, and Ding Darling um, has a wildlife refuge named after him here, Lake Darling in North Dakota. So that was a close connection of Roosevelt's that led to, to that. Um, I think I, I mentioned um, religion. Um, this doesn't cover everything, but I wanted to start by just saying this, that Impact is not the same as legacy, and legacy is not the same as impact. Uh, so what, measuring his impact on the, on, on the post-Rooseveltian America is a hard thing to do. It's fun to try. Uh, but legacy is a little bit easier, because we know he has a 
legacy of writing. That's measurable. We know he has a legacy of pronouncements. We know that he has a legacy of the refurbishing of the White House, uh, uh, Sagamore Hill. Th those are things that, that, that you can get your hands on. But impact is a much more elusive concept. So just to lay the groundwork there and pick it up wherever you want. Michael, you start, and we'll just see what happens. And we'll get you involved as soon as we can. Is this on? Yeah. Um, I, well, I don't know where to start there other than to say that's a that's not a comprehensive list, but you probably couldn't make a comprehensive list if you wanted to. And it's interesting at the lunch uh, when the religion was mentioned, he had a, he had a strong faith, Christian faith, um, and uh, he kept a Bible with him often. That's a side of Roosevelt you don't often hear about. And the the family man is probably an understudied one as well. And there's a I'm, I'm editing a book now. Uh, reminiscences of TR's contemporaries, and one of them is uh, his his son, his son's Kermit. Uh, his friend, his best friend, is a guy called Barkley Farr, who grew up in New Jersey and and then, and hung out with Kermit a lot. But they also got into some really, really troublesome activities, uh, setting fireworks off at neighbors' houses, um, you know, blowing up part of the the. The house, as a result, they raided the White House pantry on a bank holiday weekend, which means that they couldn't get food in for the guests that were coming for Labor Day or Memorial Day. I forget which one it was. They got up to some pretty troublesome activities, but Roosevelt never yelled at them. He never he gave them trouble for it to a certain extent, but he didn't he didn't he didn't yell at his kids. He was very tender with them, and uh, and he's also he, he was a tender policymaker when it came to family and children. He's the, he, he revived, actually he started the, the White House Conference on Children, which has since become uh, you know, a major conference to look at the health, welfare, and care given to children in America. There's some, there's some really lasting legacies that we don't talk about an awful lot. We focus on the man, which is a very mythical image, and um, part of that myth is, is, is also this, his tenderness as, as, a, as a human being and his compassion, his empathy. I mean, just to follow up for one second, Michael, wouldn't you say that, that the Roosevelt family in the White House creates the benchmark for all subsequent ways we think about families in the White House, that they rambunctious, uh, active, photogenic, um, in the news. Um, he was not afraid to trot them out a little bit. Edith was more wanting to protect them. But, but now we think of families in the White House. We don't really think, say, and I mean no disrespect, but of the Trump family in quite the same way or the Obama family in quite the same way. So Edith and Theodore Roosevelt were like you and Sharon, I think. You know, Edith <laughs> was keeping everyone to time and task, and TR was letting the kids walk into the Oval Office and disrupt important cabinet meetings to just have a chat about whatever. Um, it's a really interesting family dynamic. Edith is the taskmaster, no question about it. The enforcer. The enforcer, and she's, she's stern, not, you know, not, not mean or unkind, but she's stern. And, uh, and TR is, is, he never keeps the time and gets, gets into trouble with the boys. In fact, that's what Barkley Farr says in his remembrance of Roosevelt is, is that he just felt like he was another one of the boys. Like he was a, a 10 year old kid just messing around with, with his, his, his kids and his family. Now there's, there's other dynamics in there too. Alice Roosevelt was, was, that was a complicated relationship. You know, she had, she was, uh, her mother was uh, not Edith Roosevelt, although she called her mother and they, they acted very much like a family. So there, there are some complicated dynamics in there as well. But on the whole, yeah, I think you're right. They do sort of set the trend for this rambunctious, lively, and entertaining family in the White House, yeah. Um, Rick, you pick it up anywhere you want. Um, we all know that Roosevelt said, I can do one of two things run the country or control Alice and all like that. But the story goes he was so tender with his, even his sons that when they said good night, they not only kissed, but kissed on the lips, which is an odd thing, especially for a macho man and sons he drove. He could drive them hard too. Theodore was sent home from Groton almost having a nervous breakdown because he was driven, he thought, by his father over the limit. Um, but Roosevelt, uh, the, both the Roosevelts kept their children so protected, and he had a great relationship with the press. So he let them know it was hands off, except for certain postcards, an occasional newspaper photo. Um, we saw the White House police, and Quentin was it there. Um, that was great. That was not every day of every seven and a half years. So they managed that. 
and there's a great, this both speaks to Quentin's native intelligence and also how the Roosevelt's were as parents, but a reporter once cornered Quentin somewhere on the grounds of the White House or something to get a tidbit about what was going on, and the youngest boy, Quentin, said, uh, I see the president occasionally, but I know very little about his personal life. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> he would have made a great president himself. I think he would have made a great president himself. But on the larger question, and you asked about legacy versus impact, and it's my opinion, and I only realized this as it flowed out when I was writing Bully, um, that I think somewhere between legacy and impact, I think it's arguable that Theodore Roosevelt is the only one of our presidents about whom the first line of the obituary or the first uh, paragraph of his biography would not necessarily list being president as his main contribution as a person, as an American, as a human being. He had so many other activities and accomplishments, not to put down the presidency and all we talked about, all the balls he started uh, rolling, but I think in a way that's his impact and legacy, the fact that he was um, omnivorous, curious, intelligent, bold, and a polymath. Everything he saw, he wanted to master and did, and that that inspired me as a kid. I've been asked a lot since yesterday, why did you like Roosevelt? What attracted you as a kid? And even though I was young, I, r I realized in the history books that this man had integrity and he had honesty and he had strength. And oh yeah, the Panama Canal and all like that. So somehow, and cartoons show this, but somehow that personality comes through history. And uh, that's a unique legacy. Well, just on behalf of Jefferson, I have to disagree with you because you said that you know he's the only one who, for whom the presidency wasn't the thing. Uh, Jefferson said Declaration of Independence, Virginia Statute of Religious yeah. Liberty, and the University of Virginia didn't even mention the presidency as one of his uh, achievements. So neither did Roosevelt. Right, uh, and, and one of my favorite of all stories as we leave family here is um, a reminiscence by Eleanor, that not not our Eleanor, but the Eleanor who was the wife of Ted, his son, and she said. She gave this reminiscence about her first nights at Sagamore Hill. You know the story. And, and she said, this is the most exhausting family you've ever seen. She said, they play hard, they roughhouse, there are pillow fights, they're all talking and shouting, everyone's trying to get in on the conversation. They go out playing point to point and they're shooting stuff and lifting stuff and doing hang. And she said, it all goes on all day long until you just want to go to bed. And then finally, it's time to bed. And they all kiss and hug each other for a long time. And they finally bed down, and then somebody jumps up and says, oh, I had a story I wanted to tell you, and they all start up again. And it's just like, you get the sense, it's like Walton's Mountain from the old show, that, that the Roosevelts will just not go to sleep. And poor Eleanor was like, how do you survive this family? It's, it's a glorious, and, and, and you talked about the sense of humor. T.R. had a sense of humor, and he, was, he, he inspired humor in other people, because everyone got that there was a clown in there somewhere. Uh, Jeff, uh, pick it up anywhere you want on legacy, impact, any of these areas. Okay, this works. Yeah, you're right. You're fine. You got it. Um, well, I just wanted to say uh, I like Brian Swanson's thing about uh, TR Sports, and I, and I just wanted because I wanted to say it as a thing, but it's no opportunity. Uh, he talks about this mayor of New York City, John Mitchell, whose nickname was the Boy Bear. He was like half of Roosevelt's age. Roosevelt passed him as a 30 pounds overweight, uh, recovering back of <laughs> Mitchell died less than a year later of a heart attack. No, he died. It's in the, it's in the preface to Sons of Freedom. Yeah, he, yeah. Was, he joined the Army Air Corps. Oh, yeah, that's he right. Trained, he's training in Louisiana. Uh -huh. He went up on a that's training right. flight, and he forgot to fasten his seatbelt, and the plane like, did a little barrel roll, and yeah. it was the boy, the boy bear, he fell out of the Exactly. And went The American century was, was more than our um, foreign policy and international relations. Talk a little bit more about 
Roosevelt's, contrib yeah. Roosevelt's <laughs> contribution to the American century? Well, let me, let, me, let me just speak to the impact, what I think is its impact. Uh, just as I, think, as I thought about it when I was preparing the talk is a bunch of things. First, you know, the international relations aspect is that, uh, as I said in the talk, Americans had come to regard themselves as unfit to have an empire because of our peculiar democratic tradition, you know, born in revolt against the British Empire, what right did we have to acquire overseas possessions? And, um, you know, he's the guy who really breaks that mold, who really says, we live in a new world with new rule sets, and if America is going to grow, if it's going to survive and prosper against these encircling great powers who have no such inhibitions, we need to throw these things overboard. And of course, one man can't do this alone. He had to have fellow travelers working with him, people like Admiral Mahan. I mean, there's a great story about, you know, at, when Mahan publishes Influence of Sea Power Upon History in, in uh, 1890, which becomes the great propaganda piece for building a fleet, uh, a high seas fleet that will rival the British Navy, the German Navy. Um, you know, uh, the Navy, in their infinite wisdom, s decide they're going to send Mahan, who can't even sail, to sea. You know, he's really a desk admiral, a brilliant mind, and he needs to stay at the War College and keep writing. And the quotes from Roosevelt about the Navy's decision to send Mahan to sea, he's like, what the hell is wrong with the Navy? You know, and, and he just talks about the stupidity of the brass and everything else. So he has people like Mahan, he has people like Henry Cabot Lodge, he has other um, people that um, are pushing for this expansion along with him. But as we've all discussed, he's the guy who provides the impulse. I mean, just this ceaseless energy, pounding energy. And he, he won't let people alone. And everybody that comes into contact with him, whether they're foreign people or Americans, they all talk about his, his, his boundless energy. And his, he won't let something go. If, he, if it's something that he thinks needs doing, he just keeps pushing, pushing, pushing. So he doesn't single-handedly do it, but he's a powerful force in making Americans, uh, you know, drop this pose that we're too good for empire. And remember, there's a lot of opposition to it. People like Mark Twain. Mark Twain is, you know, hotly opposed to U.S. empire. Talks about how the U Americans can't play the European game. We, we're different. We're, you know, we're just constitutionally different. And then, of course, the Democratic Party strongly opposed, and then big elements in the Republican Party as well. So he has his work cut out for him. And I just think he shows a real strategic grasp. And, um, you know, in his second inaugural address, Woodrow Wilson talks about, uh, you know, because he's you're preparing to take us into this First World War, and he talks about our, we have to leave behind, I forget the exact, it's in the book, but, our, but he uses the word provincial, our provincial mindset. America has always been a provincial power. And we could no longer be a provincial power. We now have to step into the front rank of nations, and we have to intervene in world affairs. And this is something that Roosevelt grasped long before for all those economic and strategic reasons that I mentioned, you know, I enumerated in the talk, all those statistics about GDP, about population, about national power. And he, he, he senses this, and he, he, he wants it. I mean, the... The, the shame and the anger he feels when we don't take Hawaii in the 1880s during the Benjamin Harrison administration. He's just incensed because he's sure that we're leaving this on the table and somebody else is going to come and pluck it. So, uh, he, his, so he, really, he really, this business of the U.S. as a global power. Um, you know, as the U.S. Navy says, uh, don't piss us off. We can be there. We can be anywhere in the world in 24 hours. That idea of a expeditionary America that is, that is present everywhere as sort of a system administrator for the world. That, that, that's Roosevelt's impact. That's his legacy, too. And, uh, and then just another thing on, on the politics of it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a truism now that whether you listen to the Democratic debates or you look at the Republican Party, you know, you, the, the factions that are on, on the left and the right, the hardcore Trump people, and the hardcore progressives, they're a very small number. Most of America is in the center. You look at the polling data for things like, you know, universal background checks. I mean, it's just like 
most Americans are very reasonable people, very centrist people. And Roosevelt knows this. And I think, you know, I, you know, Roosevelt would be appalled at the state of our politics, as he was appalled by the state of his own politics. And that's why I think he was so active in this progressive agenda. And he was so, he was so determined to make sure that the Republican Party represented the progressive agenda. And that it didn't slip back into this kind of cozy relationship with big business. And uh, why he was so jealous, in a way, of Woodrow Wilson for stealing his thunder, in a way. But the, um, that's another big piece of Roosevelt, the way he grasped that America is driven by this vital center. And he tailors policies to this reasonable, vital center. And, uh, you know, we, we, we drift away from that time to time, but I think it's always there as it is, as it is today. The vast majority of Americans would embrace Rooseveltian policies if only we could find a Roosevelt. So, Michael, let me ask you a question about... So, in... in, in um, Mer Oh, sure, sure, please, please. Um, I, think it's I, I think your talk has is, is really uh, stimulated me and, and my thinking about Roosevelt as kind of schizophrenic in that he's, or multiple personality, you know, in that he, before the War of 1898, he is touting about expansion, but then as soon as he becomes president in 1901, he's no longer talking about benevolent assimilation and he's no longer uh, saying that the Philippines, I mean, this is something he steps into. It's not something that he, he wanted. He didn't want to acquire the Philippines, I don't think. Now, he did want to acquire Puerto Rico. That was an easy geographical, you know, small population. That was, that was a, different, a different story. But 10 million people in the Philippines, he sided more, I think, with Judge Day on, let's take Manila, a port like Mahan, as you're talking, that strategic idea. That's still there. But I wonder what you think about this multiple personality Roosevelt, the one where he's not in power and he is a jingo, and he is touting expansion. And then the Roosevelt that is president, who strategically looks very different. I mean, the United States technically shrinks when Roosevelt's president. It loses territory. And in terms of, of power, that speak softly becomes more prominent than the big stick nearly. I mean, that's my take on it. I just wondered what you thought. Well, I mean, I, I think that he, I agree. I think he uh, doesn't give a lot of thought to the problems of assimilation. I mean, he does reference it, and he talks about the difficulty. I meant, that mentioned during the talk how he sees the great weakness of the British Empire that is trying to federate all these different peoples uh, without a sort of common core, and he sees the same problem arising in, in societies like the Philippines. So he sees this problem, but he's in his haste to grab this territory because if... if he worries that, you know, Spain's going to lose these colonies and Germany will step in or Japan will step in or Britain will step in. And, you know, he sees what's happened in China, where China has been carved up by the great powers, and uh, sees the same thing playing out in the Philippines. So I, don't, I think for him, the first step is to establish us there. Then we can worry about the rest later. Same with Hawaii. Like, you know, the quote where he says, I didn't create them, they're there, we got to take them or somebody else took them. Very pragmatic view of it. And again, I think it's, um, it's really presentist, as they say in the academy, to um, not to say that you're being, but to say, you know, people so often do today, they'll be like, oh, they'll, they'll wring their hands over, he didn't give ample regard for this or the rights of the Filipinos or that, but nobody did at the time. Nobody did at the time. And this was uh, something that he had an idea, a very paternalistic idea, we will raise them up, you know, the same way all the empires claim to do. But he was probably a little bit better intentioned than others. Uh, but he didn't spare too much thought about it, but nobody did. He was chiefly concerned with the balance of power and chiefly secured with securing the best possible strategic configuration for the United States. Rick. Yeah, the problem that a lot of us, a lot of people seem to have with Roosevelt and assimilation, from my point of view, is not that he resented newcomers or recent immigrants, or we know he was an Anglo-Saxon champion, but uh, the greatest decade of immigration in the U.S. was 1900 to 1910. And if he was so much against immigration, he would have lifted some sort of finger to stop that, and he didn't. He was against the hyphenation because he wanted people to be Americans, not necessarily because they were the scum of the earth and could pretend not to be. That's 
my view, it's a little nobler than history has turned it to, but I think if there's a schizophrenia uh, aspect, it's not so much with him through the years, through his life, but the American public, and here's what I mean from my point of view. In 1920, it was pretty much assured and assumed that he would be president again if he wanted to. Uh, but James put out the light, so that didn't happen. But he would have been uh, president again, it seems. I don't believe that the same Theodore Roosevelt could be elected to almost anything today the same policies, his writings, and all like that, but he was so distinctive as a person, all the things we're holding up as positive virtues, his eccentricities and everything. He would be savaged on Saturday Night Live. Um, he'd be on Saturday Night Live. He'd get himself right in there. Well, he might, but he just wouldn't be viewed the same way. Now, part of it was the times. Um, I mean, we, this photograph, we talked, every president before Roosevelt had to be formally attired and all like that. He loved the shiny top hats and everything and the swallowtail coats. But he was very comfortable being, and by the way, you said that photograph was homage to North Dakota. So I was taken in a studio in Lower Broadway in New York with phony grass and a backdrop. So <laughs> um, that's uh, included in the price of admission. But um, I really wonder how he would be perceived and appreciated by the public today. We'll never know, but it's not a slam dunk that he would be as revered as, you know, have, have record-making victories uh, in his campaigns. Well, I mean, that raises a larger question. You know, one view is political genius will find a way that if he were alive today, he'd figure it out. He'd figure out how to do it. Another is that, um, you know, tastes change and so on. Just one quick thing. I want to turn to the audience here, but about kind of the possibility of, schizophrenia or manic depressiveness, it's, it's interesting that every time Roosevelt is about to face an election, like the three or four days before, he writes letters to his children saying, well, we've had a good run, probably not going to happen this time. Uh, I've had, I've had a, the best life of the next number of people I know. If we have to go back, I've, and he's constantly kind of preparing himself for defeat. And, and he has, a, there's, a, there's a super confident Roosevelt, and then there's a somewhat insecure Roosevelt, and they, and they, they, they kind of vie for control of his being, and we're so thrilled by the superconfident Roosevelt that we forget that there is this darker self-doubt that creeps in quite often in his life. You got to use the thing. I said like Churchill, right? The black dog. And they could not, they could not enjoy each other. By the way, that's right. Uh, thoughts or questions similar, for any what? or all of our um, participants? We're, this is your chance to yes, here. Speak up. I think this question is probably uh, more for Professor Waller. Is that what you're uh, I was wondering if Roosevelt ever made any comments regarding public policy towards the handling of the great flu epidemic of 1917, because that killed far more soldiers in World War I than were actually casualties of the war. And then there was the uh, Sedition Act, and you couldn't criticize the government about it. That contributed to the fall. So I was wondering if you ever made a comment. Yeah, Roosevelt in the last years made the flu epidemic. Uh, to that, I don't know. I mean, uh, the flu epidemic, horrible. And uh, absolutely, I talk in the book about the troop transports coming over to bring doughboys over to France, and they arrive on the wharves at Brest and Saint-Nazaire, and half the ship comes off dead, you know, and they just have mass graves laid out in the French ports for all the flu More victims. servicemen died of the flu than of uh, battle. Yeah. Well, like 58 million worldwide died of the flu epidemic of 1918. But uh, as, as for what Roosevelt said, I never came across anything. He's know. running out of energy by this time, for one thing. You know, this is getting really late in the game for Roosevelt. In his last couple of years, you know, Corinne later said that the River of Doubt adventure took 10 years yeah. off of his life. And he was a sick man for much of the time in those last three or four years. I heard he made an appearance, a speech at an airfield outside St. Louis, and someone asked him how he got there, and he said, flu. But I think that's... <laughs> uh, you know, you Does that answer your question? Just, just, <laughs> just, just can't, can't leave it alone. Can I, I have a quick question for Michael. All right. Because um, you showed the slide of his children, right? Um, and I just came across the children uh, in the, you know, Kermit and Archie and Ted Jr., in the course of the war as, as, as soldiers. And uh, 
And then I think Kermit was in the CIA later. He was in Iran during the, 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 the Mossadegh coup, right? That's the next Kermit. That's the next Kermit. Okay. That's Kermit's son, yeah. And okay, he was, Kermit's he, son. Well, so then of, of, of Teddy's sons, what is the deal with them? They seemed a little bit eccentric. Was, uh, were they? Uh, I think Rick mentioned this, that you know, he, he really drove Ted, his namesake, very hard. So much so around the time of the War of 1898, uh, Edith and Alice said, you need, to, you need to really just leave him be. Uh, he, he got very sick. And, and I think they, there's Archie Jr., which would have been his grandson, who we only met for a couple of days. He died a couple of days after Archie was born, I think. Um, he writes a book called, uh, it's a, he was an intelligence officer in the CIA. He worked on Operation uh, Ajax in Iran in 1955. 56, and, uh, and worked with the British on basically bringing down Mohammed Mossadegh. And uh, anyway, he... They're great. In one of my books, because he's in that, in his, one of the greatest quotes, he goes, the stress was so bad that even the cigarettes and the vodka limes tasted awful. <laughs> that was Kermit. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Um, I, Archie, his cousin, and uh, close confidant, both of them were in the CIA, said that uh, Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, gave them a model by which to live and, and relates the American century through their lineage. That the American century, which is why I think it's great that you, you titled your talk American Century, because most of us think of Henry Luce when we think of American century, but it's, it's Roosevelt and the connections between TR and the next generations are, are really clear and apparent through his lineage, but also through other political figures like Henry Stimson or Frank Knox that would have been in the, the war cabinet, Franklin Roosevelt's war cabinet. He drove his, his family very hard, though, too. Those boys were really... And I think his great regret with Quentin dying was that he drove, he drove him into the war. He drove his whole family into the war. And, you know, Quentin, his youngest son, then expires in the war. Yeah. And no offense to the Roosevelt family, but we don't have to say that, so erase that from the tape. Um, a lot of the problems in the Middle East are at the doorstep of... Roosevelt descendants, grandsons, uh, overthrows, rewritten borders, and a lot of the resentments that happened during the end of colonialism and right after that were CIA machinations that were oftentimes uh, uh, architect plans by the Roosevelts. And, and Arthur Balfour, when he made his famous declaration about Palestine, when he was redrawing the map of the Middle East, he consulted Roosevelt. He visited Roosevelt in, I think it would have been 1917, in and around the time, that I think the declaration comes the following year. He consulted year. TR. He, he visited Oyster Bay, and he talked to TR about the Middle East. And this was, yeah, so this was when he made, a, he made a trip to visit Wilson to talk about the end of the war and negotiating the peace settlement. And on his way out of the United States, he goes to Oyster Bay to meet someone that he had only become friends with after TR had left the presidency. They meet at Checkers in, in England in 1910, uh, and they spark up a relationship. And Balfour, a former prime minister when TR was president, becomes an important character in the British War Cabinet, and eventually the, the person responsible for redrawing the map of the Middle East. I guess, I guess Mike, as you think about political dynasties like the Kennedys or the Bushes, uh, or even the Clintons, you know, there seems a real continuity between the the, the figures, but then you look at the Roosevelt's and there's this big, your slide pointed to that there's this huge debate among the children, like, well, is he more like Ted or is he more like Franklin, right? And uh, well, so if you talk about a Roosevelt dynasty, well, what does it mean? I think they, 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 they come to grips with that in World War II. I think that's why the American century is such a fitting title for how the Roosevelt's conceive world power and America's place in the world is that Ted gives up the fight with, T with, uh, with FDR in 1944, I think, and then goes in, into the war. Alice is the only one that continues to fight uh, for a different idea of, of TR. The, the, the sort of a peace overcomes the family, and they kind of agree that Franklin Roosevelt, in many ways, is, the, is, a, is a rightful heir and descendant of TR. I, don't, I think there's a convergence of, of sorts there. And Clay, you uh, mentioned earlier about um uh, or it might have been at the, one of the sessions this morning um, about this question of legacy and what if, what would have happened. If he had never been born, yeah. Yeah, and I mean to touch on what if he had lived another 10 years, that's how I'll uh, end my talk. But um, 
Alice, we were talking about the America First Committee. Well, talk about the League of Nations. Henry Cabot Lodge, Roosevelt's blood brother, was a mild reservationist. Alice Roosevelt Longworth was a rejectionist, and she would hold meetings in her DuPont Circle apartment in Washington with Bora and others, Hiram Johnson and other rejectionists. So she was, even if you want to put it this way, to the right of Lodge, and she sure was an American firster, and even Edith, the shrinking violet, um, spoke at America First rallies. So it's very interesting. We can't know, but can we guess from the action of his children and his associates in succeeding decades, the New Deal and the war, can we extrapolate where TR might have been on those subjects? That's an interesting legacy question. I'm, you know, I'm sort of with Jeff on this. You know, you think of John Adams and John Quincy Adams, a, a great deal of continuity in the way they saw the world and their, and their political outlook. The Kennedys, um, at least by 1968, are America's liberals. Um, I was shocked this morning when you showed that slide and, and, and showed us that even his own children, not his grandchildren, not the Hyde Park Democrat Franklin side, but his own children are at war over his legacy. And that Archie can think that a kind of pseudoscientific racist tract is in line with his great father's view when almost none of us would ever see the possibility of that. So how does it come about that children of so colorful a figure who had such a deep commitment to family and a cohesive family that's always talking all the time, how can the children be at war over the man's basic principles? They still are, and this probably shouldn't be recorded, but I still think you can look at the descendants of those strands of his family and see still big differences. And yet they still come together at events, and there, there are certain things that they don't... Um, you know, the, that Archie side, you know, Archie, the one who was talking about Roosevelt legacy as a segregationist and a populist, his kids are still the most conservative part of the family. And Alice, her kids aren't, they, they, she doesn't have a, a big brood, so to speak. Um, but, you know, Kermit's, Kermit's family, they're, they're still the most progressive part of the family. They're the ones that got on best with uh, the, the Hyde Park crowd. And the Theodore Roosevelt line, the Ted's and the third and fourth and fifth and sixth, they're all conservationists. I mean, really strong passion for conservation still to this, this day. You know, they invest their, their, their money in those sort of campaigns. So you can almost see the various legacy themes amongst the children and their descendants. It's frightening. You know, there would be two ways strange. to look at that. One is, what a great family that can, can, can embrace so much diversity of thought. The other would be, there's something profoundly dysfunctional in a family where one of your sons says, my father would be a... A segregationist, when, when, if Roosevelt himself were there, he would repudiate that book, maybe gently. Thoughts, questions? Yes, here. Oh, the, swamp. <laughs> the swamp? The swamp. Oh, the swamp. Uh, okay, we're going to back that one, right? Um, <laughs> uh, all right so he called him the lunatic fringe. That's what, that was his name for anyone. Well, Michael, on... explain the squad in case there are any. Oh, sorry. The, the squad is, uh, well, mainly the four uh, de Democratic congresswomen. Uh, who are uh, advocating for a, sorry, slightly more radical than uh, than than uh, the centrist Democrats, I guess. Uh, th things like the Green New Deal and, uh, and uh, healthcare for all, etc. A, a, a more um, a, a, a more resistance towards the policies of Israel and so on. There's that as well, yeah, of course. And um, so, how would he handle this? I mean, he'd call this the lunatic. Well, fringe, he called him the lunatic. He, does, he doesn't deal with the lunatic fringe. He doesn't. He doesn't. He doesn't rate them. And it's, you know, for example, on the issue of arbitration, you know, this was a, a, a thing that he championed arbitration. But in the same breath, he didn't like the hardcore arbitrationists who would who would accept peace at any price. Uh, you know, he wanted a strategic peace that was going to be sustainable and right for the United States whereas he thought some arbitration advocates were peace at any price pacifists, and that wasn't him. Yeah, even Taft, that's right, yeah. There's a thought here, yes. Talking about the difference of the children, uh, I, I, in my own children's case, it surprises me how one of them points out that this was most important to them in growing up, and another one something else. And maybe the children 
took on these different aspects of their father depending on the age at which they were. Was there a particular age if one of these children was the father was very uh, into this conservation, making the national parks? Another one a different age when the father was very upset about all these immigrants not speaking English. Uh, I don't know. So does age sequencing and the current events uh, timeline have anything to do with I this? I don't think so, but that's just my first impression. That's a very interesting question to plumb. I don't know. But it's, it would be worth trying to track, of yep. course, because very interesting. You know, yeah. my daughter, for example, um, remembers 9-11, but her, her children won't. And so you know, what happened, where you were when you first come into consciousness and the things that are obsessing your parents or your parents are focusing on, can, and Roosevelt was a many-minded person in his politics. There's continuity and change in his politics. You know, politics. it's interesting you say that because at my age, uh, older than your kids, older than you, older than everyone, I'm often asked, where were you when Kennedy was shot? I have an alibi for that. I was in uh, high school French class, so I don't know why people keep asking, trying to pin me down where I was. But right. uh, that's a very interesting question. It's really worth a lot of... Uh, of thought to be fun to uh, we have, we, we, to track that. Uh, I like that question. I want to ask uh, Michael a question because of um, before we run out of time here. Uh, you know, in Merrill Peterson's book, The uh, Jefferson Image in the American Mind, uh, which is this brilliant pathfinding book, he, he tries to chart how Jefferson's reputation and, in the national memory shifted over time, decade by decade. And we know there were vicissitudes where Jefferson was riding high and periods where he was associated with uh, Calhoun and nullification and so on. It's a brilliant book. Can you, can, is there any way to chart Roosevelt's reputation sort of decade by decade or era by era since his death? Yeah, I think so. I, so I, the 1920s are really, uh, I suppose it's living memory then. People that were alive in the 1920s and thinking about Roosevelt were affected by him personally or you know, th through his politics. So he's, and, and like everything, I remember when Gerald Ford died, everyone said, oh, actually, he was a great president, wasn't he? And that seemed quite strange because in 1974, people thought pardoning Nixon was just about the worst crime in the world. So the further you get away from the death of a president, the further things are liable to change. In the 1920s, even people like William Jennings Bryan were saying, uh, TR wasn't the worst. Um, but in the 1930s, there's a book written uh, by Henry Pringle, which you know turns everything on its head. He was a debunker, and he wrote a, a vicious biography. Really, in which many won regards. the Pulitzer Prize. Won the Pulitzer Prize, and was by far and away the best research biography of its day. Uh, he had full access to all of the archival records up until 1909. No other researcher had that sort of access. Edith Roosevelt had closed the archives to serious historians. So Pringle comes along and writes a, a, a psychological portrait of a, of a madman, really, of a, of a man consumed by ego, and that shapes the, the impression of Roosevelt for at least 20 years. And you can see movies or plays like Arsenic and Old Lace, and you can look at uh, Teddy Brewster, you know, the crazy Teddy running up the, hill, running up the stairs screaming charge and burying dead people in the, in the basement. That was the crazy Teddy impression. And it lasts up until about the 1950s when there's a revival, and a lot of it is based on American nationalism. The Cold War is, is really um, gripping the American psyche, and Roosevelt is uh, a, an American patriot again. There's the anniversary of his death. There's a bunch of commemorative activity that just comes Which into Hagedorn its own. Did. And by the way, in the, in yeah. the 1958 uh, national commemoration, which Hagedorn, this is sort of his last gasp as, as the major Roosevelt protector, um, there was a symposium on this campus. Uh, and guess who spoke? John F. Kennedy spoke here during the Roosevelt centennial, thanks to Hagedorn, um, Amazing that uh, this was Kennedy was warming up, um, and he was giving, taking any speaking gig he could get, apparently. But he came here and gave a really spirited talk. So Hagedorn was a protector yeah. and an amazing one. And uh, Carlton Putnam's biography came out then, which is largely forgotten unjustly, which should be reprinted. But I, I still think it's the best one volume Roosevelt biographical treatment of any. But things started to change in Stephen Lawrence, a book and such. So. Uh, TR has been on the upswing since then, and Wilson on the downswing pretty much since Arthur Link's books and everything. So, you think Vietnam affected 
TR's legacy? Because my, my sense is, is that Vietnam was a little bit of a dip. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. How about yeah. Robin Williams, Michael? Um, those films are wildly successful. More people get their history that way now than in other ways. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but there he's portrayed as kind of a harmless bombast, lovable, pretty harmless in the end. Yeah, but it's just so ridiculous that you don't have to pay it much attention as a historical thing, right? I mean, it, he falls in love with Pocahontas. I mean, that's, you know, it's absurd, isn't it? I'm made of wax, Larry. Like, don't, don't take me seriously. I think there's a part of that in that film. The same thing with uh, Rose of Elvis. There's, it, it's caricature again. It's gone back, caricature. It's gone, it's gone in a different direction. It's not to be taken. Where are things headed? Well, I think your point actually earlier was, was quite astute about uh, Roosevelt's warts being more pronounced now than they might have been in, in, in kind of the 90s up until the, the late 2000s. So I think the chance of him being seen as a, a racist, as a demagogue, as a jingoist, uh, as a jingoist I think those, those sort of themes could, be, could become more popular again, uh, depending on, on, wh on where things go. And again, he wrote so much that he makes it easy. If you want to go mine something out of Roosevelt that puts him in a bad light, it's a pretty easy thing to do, Native Americans particularly. Um, well, I mean, that's why I asked the question, uh, what, what do you thought the Democrats would have thought of him? And I don't know. I think it's a little bit disingenuous, not to say you're being disingenuous, but to say that, uh, you know, that Elizabeth Warren would like him. Yeah, she would like him. She'd like the new nationalism, right? But she... Uh, she definitely would not agree with his foreign policy, his language, his, his very masculine approach to everything, his use of, his liberal use of uh, ethnic slurs, right? And again, that's just, I, so I, I think that, and I think everybody on that stage would have taken a step back, oh, horrors, you know, he's way too male, you know, he's way too forceful, he's way too opinionated, he's, you know, so I, I just war. think, I think, uh, be interesting to see to the extent that anybody's interested in history anymore you know uh well yeah well yeah but i mean here i mean uh i thought i made an okay case for it though I was, I was hoping we were convinced uh i just think that he's not a politically correct president at all he's not um and yet his policies he has a he has a he has a he has a, a soft heart for working people, he wants to give a square deal, he's got a good sense about fairness, so he's right in all the important areas, but in all these sort of uh, atmospherics surrounding his views of, of uh, empire, his views of immigrants, um, and I would agree with, with Rick that if he had wanted to you know, pat, you know, propose new immigration laws to stanch the flow of immigrants, he would have, so that's a, that's a vote of confidence in him. But certainly his language, you know, he, he, he was very, uh, he, he was very uh, discriminatory, his language about them. All these things would come to the fore in any contemporary treatment of Roosevelt. So I think it would be interesting to see how he's treated. I think one thing we can say quickly, um, after, 100 years after his death, um, that he's been baked into our history, our culture so much, that the treatment at the hands of Pringle or the movies like or Broadway plays like Arsenic and No Lace, they caused a dip uh, in his reputation and a new way of seeing Roosevelt. When I was a kid and started collecting Roosevelt stuff, my father would always do the charge. Let's, you know, he made fun of Roosevelt. And, um, I think TR is past that, and there can be books against him and for him and dissecting him, but I think he's secure and whether it's the passage of time or just the great number of great qualities he had, I think it's finally, the cement has been set. Um, there was a question over here, yeah. Thank you. Uh, how would the panel evaluate Roosevelt's uh, race relations in the context of his times? Yes, uh, he had Booker Washington over for dinner at the White House, which caused controversy in the South, but then also there was the Brownsville Army affair, which disappointed a lot of African Americans at that time. Uh, just curious as to how, within the context of his own times, you would evaluate uh, uh, TR's race relations. You know, Roosevelt and race are very, very, very complex subject. I don't have a lot of time to pick it up. Well, I, 
maybe it's, it's too difficult to evaluate them in their time. Uh, you know, I've been feeling for Al Roosevelt and race relations, but the, uh, this is in relation to what Jeff was talking about as well. The, um, the, the freedom struggle in the 1950s and 60s was offered by the, the TRA, which is the Memorial Association, to, uh, to, to have thousands of placards with TR quotes on them about uh, race and African, African Americans, uh, civil rights in particular, and uh, they declined them. The, uh, the uh, Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference declined the placards. They didn't associate Theodore Roosevelt with a civil rights advocate. So in his time, I think it, it would have been very similar as well. People wouldn't have seen him as a civil rights advocate necessarily. Um, although I think in, at a local level, he, he promoted African Americans in particular to uh, posts, political posts, local posts, that uh, more so than any president uh, of, that, of that time. And he held the town in Alabama, I think it was Alabama, uh, hostage. Mississippi, uh, Mississippi, yeah. Mississippi, Mississippi, female postmistress. And, uh, Minnie Cox. Yeah, Minnie Cox. Black, and, black woman that was postmistress of this small town. Uh, the, 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 the white folks in the area were really appalled by that, so Roosevelt closed the post office. Closed the post office. So go get your mail somewhere it. else then. If so you there want. are many stories like that, um, but something I've never seen discussed much, and I don't know who would agree or disagree, but the Brownsville incident is so often held up as the Exhibit A, and the fact that Roosevelt was when all of a sudden black down soldiers a, a uh, go on a melee. Uh, uh, eventually, Roosevelt dishonorably discharges 140 some African American soldiers. Right, and um, it was a controversy at the time. But I think if that had been an all white regiment, it was Roosevelt's character to say, "If no one's going to fess up, you're all out of here." I don't think it was a black issue, and I think that's. Roosevelt's personality. I don't think it was his his uh, reaction to it. I don't think was racially motivated. I that think could be was, a long and interesting debate. It would. I yeah. asked Sharon for five minutes. She gave us two, uh, but that's a lot. So we'll take one last question. I saw one over here. Here. It's not really a question. It's just a comment. I, I, you know, I, I think in terms of legacy, I think maybe the thing we should think about most is that he was a genuine hero. A hero. hero. And we need a hero today. And even though the pendulum goes up and it goes down. We need a hero. So, so that, that comment has been made before. In Time Magazine, uh, Edmund Morris, George Will, and uh, Pete Axlam, they, they wrote about how we need a hero. And this was at the Watergate had happened, and Carter was president, and no one was happy with Carter at the time. And that's exactly what they wrote. We need a hero. And you know what happened? Edmund Morris and David McCullough wrote their biography, biographies of Roosevelt in 79 as a direct result of Watergate. They both say that. And so we, we see a revision of Roosevelt in, based on the American psyche. That happened. So to close, we're going to close, and then we're going to take a short break, and then we're going to have our next session with Rick Marshall. And I know you have some thoughts about, um, about um, uh, Jeff's talk earlier today, and thanks for holding them uh, until your, uh, your formal talk. But, Michael, just in, in 30 seconds, you know, some people think now that San Juan Hill and being a hero is something that Roosevelt in part constructed and if you're really measuring hero he you might want to rethink that from time to time he made an awful lot of a comparatively little what's your quick sense of that yeah my, my comment about uh, about needing a hero is is just that that's what happened that's that was the phenomenon that yeah. was the phenomenon but the reality is is i think there's he, he is he's a faulty hero too in many ways as most heroes probably are um so yeah, I don't know how to close on that, but but, but... but but it's worth examining those questions about construction of heroism. I think any, any, any question that we might have about the present now, whether it's about politics and, and, the, and the state of politics now, whether it's about questions about identities like who, who is a hero, all of them are worthy of debate and consideration, and Roosevelt will fit into the, those conversations undoubtedly. Rick, you get the last word. Heroes, even heroes, even Jenkinson has clay feet, so we oh, have to be conscious of that. But, uh, you know... No, no, no. Look, we, look at the we, time. We, Thank you, guys. We have celebrities and we have heroes. Roosevelt was both, and that's not a common thing. Celebrity and hero. Celebrity and hero. We'll leave it at that for the moment. We'll have tomorrow. We're going to have a, uh, another conversation with these folks, so uh, this is not over. Sharon. Thank you. Let's uh, give a, a round of appreciation to our panelists. <laughs>